Howdy, Chem 130 lab folk. Well, here we are again, another lab from the barn. Uh, this time, not too much lab work. We're going to build some uh, models of molecules and talk a little bit about Lewis structures. We're actually going way back to Chapter 2 and really digging deep into this concept of ionic compounds versus covalent compounds. But now we're going to start to draw pictures of them show how electrons get transferred in the ionic compounds, show how electrons get shared in the covalent compounds. Now, today we're going to focus on the covalent ones because they have a definite architecture to them, a definite shape. And a lot of times it's the shape of a molecule that dictates its real function in human physiology, for instance. In biology, they use the analogy of, for instance, for enzymes and the substrates that they work on they, they use the analogy of a, of a key and a lock mechanism that the substrate has to fit into the enzyme just perfect for the molecule to work. Well, it turns out that that's exactly the case. The shape of a molecule a lot of times dictates how it's going to behave. Not so much what it's made out of, but the shape that it's in. For instance, the front door uh, key to your house uh, it doesn't have to be made out of a particular metal. It just has to have exactly the right shape to fit that keyway. Well, molecules are the same way, and so today we're going to focus a little bit on the shape. But again, let me give a, a little brief discussion first on the difference between ionic bonding and covalent bonding. So here you go. Okay, well the first and main difference between ionic compounds and covalent compounds, if you recall, is that ionic compounds are composed of metals and nonmetals. And there's a transfer of electrons from the metal to the nonmetal. On the other hand, covalent compounds were made up of nonmetals only. All right, well, today's lab does kind of focus on the covalent compounds and how we draw their structures, again, because they have a definite architecture. But I want to take just a moment to talk briefly about ionic compounds. Okay, well, in ionic bonding, again, involving a metal and a nonmetal, the one thing we know about metals, that at least what we've learned over the semester, is that they like to lose electrons. That's one of their big properties, and nonmetals like to gain them. So when you put a metal and a nonmetal together, there's an obvious transfer of electrons then from the metal that wants to lose them to the nonmetal that wants to gain them. So transfer of electrons, that's key to the definition of, of what happens when an ionic bond forms. So that results then in the metal having a positive charge, having lost one of its negative, one or more of its negative electrons making a metal cation. Remember, we differentiate between the ions, ion being a charged atom, whether they're positive, a cation, or negative, like the nonmetal, as an anion. So once the electron gets transferred from the metal to the nonmetal, then there's a clear attraction between these oppositely charged particles, and that attraction is referred to as an ionic bond. Well, we did kind of establish this way back in chapter two. We talked about the fact that the group one cations always form plus one cations, and the group twos always form plus two. And we used that as a basis to show you how to write the formulas for simple binary ionic compounds. What we didn't show was the actual transfer of electrons. And so that's where we're headed now. Okay, well, to illustrate this transfer of electrons then between the metal and the nonmetal, what we're going to do is use Lewis dot symbols. Now, this is just the symbol of an element surrounded by dots representing its valence electrons, its outermost shell electrons. Now, you've just gone through the chapter where you did electron arrangements, 1s2, 2s2, that business. That kind of led us to the looking at the outermost skin of the atom because that's where all the action is. And it turns out that the number of electrons that reside there, at least for the representative elements, is equal to its group number. The group 1 elements all have one valence electron. The group 2s have 2. And over here, the group 3s, all the way to the halogens that have 8 outer shell electrons. They're in group 8. So if we started here with sodium and just marched our way across this third period, sure enough, sodium being in group 1, its Lewis symbol would just simply have one dot. The magnesium would have two, aluminum being in group three would have three, all the way over to argon, which has eight electrons. Now, we can use this to show how the transfer of electrons takes place. Now, notice that I'm, I'm not too concerned how you arrange the dots around the symbol. The book has a method for doing it, but it really doesn't matter. It's the number of dots that's critical. Now, I know that ultimately everybody wants to have eight electrons, so I have a tendency to put them in four sets of two. 
So whatever you're comfortable with, but it's the number of dots that's critical and not how they're arranged around the symbol. Now what we're going to do then is use this to show how this transfer of electrons takes place in ionic compounds. I should point out that this is something, this is old ground. We covered this way back in chapter two, the idea that the group one elements become plus one cations. And we showed that, how we could use that then to write formulas for very simple ionic compounds. Well, now we're going to physically show how that transfer of electrons takes place. So we're just looking a little bit more under the surface of this formation of ionic compounds. Okay, well in the formation of an ionic compound, if we wanted to show how this happens, we can use these Lewis dot symbols. For instance, in the formation of sodium chloride, it's pretty clear what happens here. The sodium has one valence electron to lose. The chlorine, being in group seven, has seven valence electrons. Notice that I've used dots on the metal and X's on the nonmetal. Don't get me wrong, electrons are electrons. It doesn't matter who they belong to. I just do this for bookkeeping purposes, so I can tell which electrons came from who. But it turns out that the chlorine desperately wants to fill that eighth spot because of this rule of eight that we're going to discuss today. Everybody wants to look like a noble gas, and they have eight valence electrons. If sodium can lose that one, it would reveal an underlying shell that has eight. So we're going to show that this electron essentially gets transferred over to fill this vacancy. Now we end up with a sodium cation. Notice that they don't show that underlying shell then of electrons. They just assume that you understand that if we strip the valence shell off of that metal, it's revealing an underlying core that looks like a noble gas. But the chlorine, on the other hand, has its original seven and the one that it got from the sodium. See why I use X's and dots? That way I can tell that I picked up one there. Well, now the book has a format for this. I think for neatness sake, they always put brackets around the nonmetal, the one that ends up with the electrons, just to kind of corral everything. And we have to put the charge out here to indicate that, yeah, we know there's an extra electron now residing on that chlorine, that chloride. All right, so this is what's called a Lewis dot formula. And it's supposed to help explain to us, which we already knew, why one sodium and one chlorine fits the bill for this compound. Well, it's because the sodium had one valence electron to give, the chlorine conveniently had one vacancy, so it only takes one of each of them to strike a bargain. All right, but suppose we did something a little bit more complex. Suppose we did something like magnesium and fluorine. Well, if I asked you to write me out a Lewis dot formula then for magnesium and fluorine getting together. Well, magnesium is in group two and has two valence electrons. Fluorine, on the other hand, is in group seven, has seven valence electrons, has one vacancy to fill. Now, the magnesium cannot stop halfway and just give up one of its valence electrons. That won't do. It must give up both in order to look like a noble gas. And fluorine cannot accommodate two electrons. However, magnesium then could accommodate two fluorines because then the number of electrons available would equal the number of vacancies available. Sure enough, an electron gets transferred to each of the fluorines. So what we end up with is a magnesium with a plus two charge on it, having lost two of its valence electrons, again revealing an underlying shell that they don't show here that's filled with electrons, and we would have two fluorides, each one with their original seven, and a negative one charge to boot because they picked up the electron from the magnesium. Now notice something here. I didn't draw them together in one big set of brackets. And a lot of times I see students doing that and it's a little misleading. They need their own set of brackets because they are definitely not attracted to each other. As a matter of fact, logistically, if we could look at this crystal structure under a microscope, the magnesium would likely be in the middle, flanked by the two fluorides. They would not want to get near each other. And so putting them in one big set of brackets with a minus two charge out in front implies somehow that they're collaborating with each other. And they're not. They're both attracted to the magnesium, but not attracted to each other. All right, so this is the format, and if they were to ask you, give me the Lewis dot formula for magnesium fluoride, they don't want this before picture with the arrows. They want it after the electrons have landed 
the charges are now on the ions after they've lost and gained electrons, and the dust has all settled. So this is the Lewis dot formula. And again, it does help kind of back up the idea that if you were to go in our stock room and look for a bottle of magnesium fluoride, that sure enough, the bottle has this formula on the front of it. Well, again, it's not like we just plucked those numbers out of the air. There is a definite method to the madness there. But now we've got a way to actually physically show how the electrons got transferred over. All right, well, there's two or three of these that are, that are in your homework in the lecture that your lecture instructor will discuss with you. But for our lab today, we're going to look at that other major class of compounds, the covalent compounds. Okay, well, here's where the real fun begins, when we start to look at covalent compounds. Now, this involves just nonmetals. Now, remember, when you put a metal and a nonmetal together, the metal wants to get rid of electrons, nonmetal wants to gain them. So, consequently, it's pretty easy to understand how the electron would transfer. But you put two nonmetals together. Now, they both want to gain electrons in order to look like a noble gas. Well, it's not as if one of them is going to sacrifice itself for the good of the other one. What happens instead is they'll kick those electrons into a common pot, their valence electrons, and they'll share them between the two metals. And they'll count the shared electrons for both of the atoms. They'll, they'll claim custody. So they'll share enough, they'll throw enough into the common pot that they can fool themselves into both thinking they've got eight electrons in their outermost shell. Consequently, they think they look like a noble gas, and that's a very stable arrangement. All right, well... That means then covalent compounds are nonmetals only. All right, so that's an easy thing to spot. Again, there's not very many nonmetals. If you remember, the metals way outnumber them on the periodic table. It involves a sharing of enough electrons to have eight, hence the rule of eight. All right, well, the simplest way to illustrate this is to start with the simplest covalent molecules there are, the seven diatomic elements. Okay, well, here's the seven diatomic elements. If you remember, they're hydrogen gas, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and then it goes right down the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Now, if we want to draw a picture of the structure of this molecule, how the electrons are shared in order for them to obey the rule of eight, we can use the Lewis dot symbols again to do this. But let's start with fluorine. This is a nice, simple one. Now, fluorine has seven valence electrons. And it would like to get one more to fill that vacancy. If there was a metal around, it would probably be willing to just give up an electron and give one to the fluorine. But say that the fluorine's trapped in a tank with only other fluorine atoms, nobody else around. Well, the other fluorine likewise is going to have seven valence electrons. I'm going to put dots on one, X's on the other. It likewise has one vacancy to fill. Well, it turns out that nonmetals will kick these electrons then into a common pot and share them between them. As a matter of fact, each fluorine is going to kick an electron into a common pot, and those electrons actually are going to reside in an orbital. Do you remember we talked about this in one of the earlier chapters? That electrons reside in p orbitals and d orbitals that have lobes that stick out. When those lobes overlap, suddenly it provides a common space for the two atoms to actually share a pair of electrons that can physically orbit both of the nuclei, sort of fooling both atoms into thinking that they own this shared pair. Now that shared pair counts for both, because again, it's physically orbiting both of the nuclei. So each fluorine then retains six electrons of its very own, which, by the way, we have a tendency to work in pairs of electrons. These are referred to as lone pairs. It turns out electrons, when they, when they reside in an orbital, remember Hund's rule, they like to go in singly first into the orbital, and then they like to pair up. So we have a tendency to deal with them in pairs. So sure enough, each fluorine retained three lone pairs, which is six electrons, and has one shared pair. So in essence, then, each fluorine sort of appears to have eight electrons in its outermost shell. Well, this is much more stable than being a fluorine just by yourself with that one glaring vacancy in your, in your outermost shell. This is at least more comfortable. Now, granted, if that 
fluorine were to run into a metal that would be willing to give it an electron of its very own, it would immediately divorce its partner and go for that electron. It would much prefer to have one of its very own. But in the absence of that, the next best thing is to partner up with another fluorine and share a pair of electrons between the two of them. Now, it's not surprising then that if we drew the same picture for chlorine or bromine or iodine, they have exactly the same number of dots because they're in the same group. So really the picture would be exactly the same except the, the letter in the middle would change. So I'm not gonna draw those, but in each case, they have seven valence electrons each and they will share one pair between the two of them in order for them to think that they have their eight. Now I wanna go on, I'm gonna leave this one here for a second. I wanna do oxygen, O2, let's back up one. Well. Let me go ahead and get rid of this so I can do it right here below. Oxygen is in group six and has six valence electrons. Now it too is needs, it has two glaring vacancies there that it needs to fill, right? In order for it to have its eight electrons. And so it will team up with another oxygen that also has six. I'm sorry, I was using dots on one and X's on the other. Let me at least be consistent. But in order for it to, to meet its need for eight electrons, each of the oxygens is gonna have to kick two into the common pot, all right? Because they need, each need to get two in this bargain. So they're gonna share a two pair between them, right? So two shared pair, two lone pair, each. Well, then each oxygen, sure enough, appears to have its eight electrons as long as we're willing to count the shared electrons for both. Well, we cleverly refer to this as a double bond between the two oxygens, right? Because they're sharing two pair. This with the fluorine would just be a single bond. We can kind of see where this is going. The number of electrons that are shared is kind of dictated by how many valence electrons they brought to the dance. As they get fewer and fewer, they're going to have to share more and more electrons. For instance, if we back up to nitrogen, nitrogen has five valence electrons. Let me put two over here. I'm going to put three in the middle because I know where this is going. In order for nitrogen to meet its need for eight electrons, it's going to have to share three pair between the two nitrogens. It's the only way around it. They only have five each. So if they share three pair between them, then sure enough, each one can kind of fool itself into thinking that it has its eight electrons. And again, we cleverly refer to that as a triple bond. Now you won't see any fourple bonds. There's single bonds where they share one pair, double bonds and triple bonds, but it never goes beyond that. Now with all these dots and X's and everything, you can see how messy this could get. So I wanna simplify things for our Lewis structures. With the fluorine, for instance, excuse me, <clears throat> as long as we all agree that we could represent that bond between the two fluorines as simply a dash, that as long as we know that that represents this pair of electrons, then we could also use a bar to represent the lone pairs that are out here. For instance, what if I did this and boxed in the two fluorines? As long as we all agree that each one of those bars represents two electrons, then each fluorine does appear to have four bars around it. Consequently, that would be its eight electrons. Personally, I find this a little more pleasing to the eye than this mess. Well, that means that something like oxygen, let me make a little bit of room here. Oxygen would be a double bond between the two oxygens. That would be the two pair. And I don't care where you put the lone pairs out here. We could put them above, below, as long as they're somewhere associated with that oxygen. Sorry, I'm getting a little chalk dust. <coughs> as long as they're associated with that oxygen and count as a lone pair, and each oxygen then appears to have its four bars around it, that's what's critical to the Lewis structure. All right, so you can see again that that might be a little easier to draw than something like this. Well, that means the nitrogen then ends up being a triple bond between the two nitrogens. And again, I don't care if you put the lone pair on the top or if you put it out here on the end, it just has to be somewhere there with that nitrogen. 
So you can see then that this is not too tricky. What dictates how the picture is going to come out is first, how many electrons did each atom bring to this picture? And then do I, how many do I have to share between the two of them in order for them to have their eight electrons? So pretty simple. All right, well, let's do some molecules that have more than two atoms in it. It gets a little bit more interesting as we go. Oh, I forgot to do a little hydrogen. Hydrogen has only one valence electron. And it's fortunate, you know, that it doesn't, well, first of all, it can't follow the rule of eight because it doesn't have eight electrons to share. But hydrogen doesn't really want eight electrons in its outermost shell. It does want to look like a noble gas, however. But the noble gas at the end of hydrogen's row is helium. Helium has two outer shell electrons, unlike all the other noble gases that have eight. So, yes, hydrogen does want to look like a noble gas, but that noble gas only has two valence electrons, and that's all it wants to get. Well, if it shares a pair with a single electron with its other partner, that means that each hydrogen then thinks it has two outer shell electrons and thinks it looks somewhat like helium, at least electron-wise. So hydrogen doesn't follow the rule of eight. It has its own little rule of two. So as we develop this rule of eight, rule of eight, rule of eight business, you gotta remember that hydrogen doesn't follow that. It's got its own little rule of two. All right, well, let's go on and do a little bit more complicated Lewis structure. Okay, well, here's my basic set of rules here. Let me even up my camera here a little bit. Uh, my basic set of rules for how to draw all Lewis structures. Now, first of all, the number of electrons that appear in your pictures for these Lewis structures is dictated by how many electrons each element brought to the dance. All right, so that's their group numbers. Remember, that's their valence electrons. So my first rule says total all valence electrons. Well, let's do an example while we're doing this. Let's do this CCL4, carbon tetrachloride. All right, well, carbon's in group four, so it's bringing four electrons to the dance. Its Lewis dot symbol would have four dots around it. Chlorine is in group seven. It's got seven valence electrons, but there's four of them. So that's 28 electrons plus these four. This thing has 32 electrons in its picture. Now here's the, the rub. We have to use all 32 of them. We gotta smear them around so that everybody appears to have eight in our picture. Well, there's a logical set of steps to take. My first step says, well, arrange the atoms radially with the first element in the formula in the middle. All right, so I'm gonna put the carbon in the middle. I'm gonna put the chlorines around it. Now, for the time being, we're not too concerned about the shape of the picture, what it looks like shape-wise. We're just worried about where the electrons are all gonna go. All right, well, my very next step says put in spokes. Now, what I mean by that is, I'm gonna put in a bar to represent a shared pair with the central atom and each one of the peripheral atoms, the ones that are on the outside. Because I know there has to be at least one bond between the carbon and each outer atom. Now, something you should, point, you should note here, for our purposes, there are not gonna be bonds between the peripheral atoms. All the bonds will radiate out from the central atom to the peripheral atom. Now, don't get me wrong, in organic chemistry, there are some ring structures that have bonds on the outside, but we're not going to go there. So for our purposes, everything's going to radiate out from the center. So in essence, then, I just put a pair of electrons between the central atom and each peripheral atom, the spokes. All right, well, that counts for eight electrons. Remember, each of those bars represents two. So I've used up eight of my 32. Well, my last rule is kind of open-ended. I said, well, distribute those. You're dealing. You got all these electrons. Give everybody who needs more electrons, more electrons until everybody has eight. Well, notice something. Now that we've given the carbon these four spokes, it has its eight electrons. The carbon does because four bars around it, eight electrons. However, the chlorines are still short because all I've given them is the one to share with the carbon. So they only have one pair each. Well, that means that they still each need three pair. Well, there's four of them. I think I have just enough electrons to give each one three more pair. So what if I boxed in the chlorines? Now remember, I've used eight of my 32, so I have 24 electrons left to play. Well, there's two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 
14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. I boxed in each chlorine with three more lone pair. That filled out its need for eight electrons, and I had just enough electrons to do the job. So, easy way to check. Sure enough, there's 16 bars in there. That's 32 of electrons. The carbon has four shared, four shared pair, one with each chlorine, and each chlorine has three lone pair and one shared pair. All right, so we distributed the remaining electrons such that the rule of eight was obeyed. Now, here's a nice thing about this. If you follow these simple rules, it will lead you to the one and only possible Lewis structure. There's no other way you could have arranged 32 electrons in that picture so that everybody, everybody appeared to have their eight. All right, well, let's do two or 300 more of these just to see how you like them. Okay, I left the rules here, but here's another example. Phosphorus trifluoride. Now, don't skip this first step because you gotta total up the valence electrons. You need to know how many electrons are allowed in the picture. Otherwise, you don't know when to stop. You'll just slather lone pairs all over everything. So, phosphorus in group five. Fluorine's in group seven, and there's three of them. That's 21 electrons plus these five would be 26. Now, you might have caught on by now. We're going to work in pairs of electrons, lone pairs and shared pairs. So if this comes up to be an odd number, you added something wrong. <laughs> Go back and look at it again. It should be an even number. Okay, so we need 26 electrons in our picture. Well, here's my usual MO. I always just put the central element in the middle. I'll put the fluorines around it. I'll just space them out any way I want because I'm not worried about the shape at this point. And I'll put in the spokes. Okay, so at that point, I've used up six electrons. Each bar I just put represented two electrons. Now, here's what I usually do. As long as I'm filthy rich in electrons, I always pay off the outside guys first. I know I just gave them one pair to share, but I know they want three more lone pair because that would fill out their eight. So I generally, as long as I'm not running short on electrons, I'm going to box them in first. Well, I've got 26 electrons. I've only played six. Let's go ahead and pay everybody off. I'll put two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen. Ooh. Well, now, if I count up all the electrons I played there, I've played 24. There's eight around each fluorine. I know that because I gave them six and they have one shared pair with the phosphorus. I have one pair left to play. I played 24. I have 26 to put in my picture. And it's pretty clear who needs them. The fluorines have already gotten paid. It's the phosphorus. Now, the phosphorus has three shared pair there. All right, well, I have one pair left to play. There's only two things you can do with a pair of electrons. Share them with one of the outside atoms or keep them for yourself as a lone pair. Well, it can't share them with the fluorine because the fluorine's already got its eight. If I share another pair with it, make a double bond anywhere, that's going to now count for the fluorine, and that's, that can't be. Rule of eight, it's only going to take eight electrons, and then it's going to stop. That means the phosphorus gets this as a lone pair. Now, here's something I want to show you. The book would do this. The book would put a couple of dots here next to the phosphorus to represent that lone pair. Or it might put a bar there to represent the lone pair next to the phosphorus. But here's what I do. And I'd like you to get in the habit of this. I draw a lone pair on the central atom like a, a bond sticking out in space with nothing bonded on the end of it. And I put a couple dots there to remind me that this is a lone pair. The reason being is that that lone pair actually resides in one of those big lobed orbitals that sticks out. And a lone pair does physically stick out into space as if it were a bond with no atom bonded on the end of it. This affects the shape of the molecule. Later when I talk about shapes of molecules, I always refer to how many legs they have, sort of like insects. And it's the number of legs that dictates what the shape is going to be because the legs try to arrange themselves as far away from each other as possible. Well, it turns out the lone pairs count as a leg because, again, they're like a bond sticking out in space with nothing bonded on it. So when I discuss PF3 and we talk about its shape, I talk about it being a four-legged molecule, even though one leg sort of doesn't have a foot on the end of it. <laughs> it still sticks out into space. So... Let's just say that lone pairs on the central atom sort of stick out. I think that's a chemical term, stick out. 
All right, so I'd like you to get in the habit of that. Now notice that we've used all 26 electrons and now the phosphorus, if we count that lone pair just for the phosphorus, now has its eight electrons. You'll see a lot of these where there might be three bonded atoms and one lone pair. As a matter of fact, later when I'm making the Tinker Toy model of this with our modeling kit, I'm going to use a vacant bonding peg to stick out into space to represent that lone pair because then the model kit actually mimics the true shape of the molecule. All right, well, let's do another. Okay, well, I got rid of our rules. You can go back and refer to them if you need to, but let's do something like carbon dioxide. Now, this is a case where you're not necessarily going to be filthy rich in electrons. You're going to actually run short of electrons. And when this happens, when you run short before you can pay everybody off on the outside, that means that you're going to end up having to double up. Probably have a double bond or a triple bond in there. So if we total up the valence electrons for CO2, it turns out that the carbon has four. It's in group four on the periodic table. Six for each oxygen, but there's two of them. So there's 12 electrons, and these four, that'd be 16 electrons in my picture altogether. I gotta use them all, no more, no less. All right, I'll put the carbon in the middle, I'll put the oxygens flanking it. Now, don't draw this if you're taking notes, but I would put in the spokes and then pay off everybody on the outside like I always do. But at that point, I just played my last electron. That's two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. That's all I've got. But I'm not done because the oxygens are happy. They've got their eight electrons, but the carbon's a little short. It's only got the two pair I gave it. So it needs two more pair, and I don't have any more that I can just give it. So the oxygens are going to have to share more. Well, if this oxygen takes a lone pair and shares it with the carbon and makes a double bond, it still counts for the oxygen, but now in addition counts for the carbon. All right, so that helped. Now that carbon's got six electrons around it, three bars. I suppose we could be unfair and make this oxygen kick in again, but Mother Nature is pretty even-handed. So let's make this oxygen kick in one, just for symmetry's sake. All right, well now, look at that. It looks like the rule of eight's been obeyed. The carbon in the middle has two bars on both sides. That's four bars, that's eight electrons. And each oxygen has two lone pair and two shared pair, that's eight electrons. Well, 16 electrons goes a long way when you double bond on both sides. All right, so this is what's going to happen to you. Whenever you draw a Lewis structure, you pay off everybody on the outside, and you think, oops, I ran out of electrons. Chances are, in order to satisfy that guy in the middle, you're going to have to have a double bond somewhere. All right, but if you're filthy rich in electrons, you got plenty, then just go ahead and pay off everybody on the outside. Anything that's left over is probably just going to be lone pairs on that central atom. Okay, well, let's try another. All right, this is one that's in the lab today. It's sulfur trioxide, SO3, and it brings up kind of an interesting point. But let's follow our rules for drawing the Lewis structure. The sulfur's in group six, the oxygen's in group six, but there's three of them. So let's see, that's a total of 18 and six, 24 electrons that have to be in this picture. All right, I'm gonna put the sulfur in the middle, oxygen's around it. Put in the spokes. And like my usual self, I'll go around and just give everybody three more lone pair, just to pay them off. And then I'll assess the damage. Well, the damage is I've used up all 24 electrons. That's it. But I'm not done because the sulfur's a little short. The oxygens are happy. They got their eight electrons, but the sulfur in the middle still needs one pair. And I can't just give it a lone pair because I don't have any more. All right, well, that means one of those three oxygens is going to have to kick in a lone pair and share with the sulfur, but only one of them, not like with the CO2 where we needed both. All right, so I'm just going to take this one on the top and double bond right there. All right, now that's one of three possible structures I could have drawn for the SO3 where the rule of eight is obeyed, absolutely. Now the sulfur has four bars around it. Each oxygen has four bars around it. But I could have just as easily put that double bond down here and left that lone pair alone or put the double bond here. Well, it turns out in reality even though these drawings are static, in nature, the molecules aren't. And that double bond never sits still. It actually spends about a third of its time there, a third of its time here, a third of its time there. 
So it gets sort of delocalized and it kind of gets smeared out over the whole molecule. Well, whenever a double bond could be drawn in more than one equivalent position, they refer to that as resonance. And in reality, one structure is not really true. You have to draw all three. That's what the book says. I'm not going to do it here. But I have to draw it again. Well, I suppose I could. With the double bond in this corner. And then again with the double bond down in this corner. Those would be the true three, the three structures that really make up the true picture of SO3. All right, like I said, with sort of a third of a double bond in each position. There's a lot of molecules where this happens, where you end up where, oh, the double bond could, be, could have been here or there, and it has to be exactly the same atom, because some atoms like the double bond more than others. But if it's identical atoms and the double bond could have gone either way, it'll actually do both. And half the time it's one, half the time it's the other. All right, so they'll ask you questions about, well, which of these molecules do you think exhibits resonance? Well, you have to draw the Lewis structure to pretty much figure that out. All right, well now, an interesting thing about resonance is that it, it causes an unusual stability in molecules. And sometimes that's not favorable, the fact that they're stable. There's a lot of molecules that we've released into the environment that aren't necessarily desirable, that exhibit resonance, and consequently, that delocalized double bond there kind of is, the, like I said, the glue that binds the molecule together. And it doesn't biodegrade as fast as it really should. And so some of these compounds, these solvents that we've created over the years can be, you know, can have significant health effects and they just won't go away. That's the problem. SO3 happens to be one of them. Uh, a lot of uh, coal-fired power plants still belch out a lot of sulfurous smoke uh, from the high sulfur coal that they burn. And a lot of that is SO2 and SO3, which combines with water in the air to form H2SO3 and H2SO4, which is sulfurous and sulfuric acid and, and produces acid rain. And again, if the SO3 didn't exhibit this resonance, it might degrade a lot faster in the environment, but it doesn't. And it's because of this delocalized double bond. Anyway, it comes up in a discussion in your chapter, and I know it comes up in a couple of the homework problems, so just kind of keep your eye peeled for it. All right, well, let's take this a step beyond. It turns out that in the book, they discuss this rule of eight, rule of eight, rule of eight, rule of eight. Then they finally reveal to you there are only four elements that always obey the rule of eight. Turns out it's only carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. These four absolutely always obey the rule of eight. But that's because their outermost shell can only hold eight electrons. They're in the second shell, the 2p, and so by the time they get to the end of the 2p subshell, eight electrons is the max. But if you're in the third row or lower, suddenly your shell can hold more than eight electrons. You get into the third shell elements, third shell can hold 18 electrons. So there's a rule then about, well, when can an atom actually take on more than eight electrons? And there's quite a few of them. They refer to these, I like the oxymoron, they call them expanded octets. Well, octet is eight. If you expand it, it's no longer an octet. But it turns out that there are cases where atoms can accommodate more than eight electrons. All right, so let me get rid of this and we'll start that explanation. Okay, expanded octets. It turns out, like I said, that if an element's in the third row of the periodic table, that means that it's out into the 3D subshell. It can actually accommodate up to 18 electrons, but it turns out it doesn't reach that. And here's the rule for expanded octets. We can draw Lewis structures that sure enough have more than eight electrons around atoms, but there's certain conditions that have to be met. Any nonmetal in the third period or lower, all right, it has to be in the third period or lower, can accommodate up to 12 electrons, right? Not at 18, it maxes out at 12. If and only if, I don't know if you're familiar with that symbol, IFF, that means if and only if. If and only if it is the central atom, the one in the middle. All right, so the one in the middle can accommodate up to 12 electrons if it's in the third period or lower on the periodic table. The peripheral atoms always obey the rule of eight. And if it's a hydrogen, that's the rule of two, remember. But again, no expanded octets on the outside, guys. Only the inside one. All right, well, let's do a couple examples of this. Well, here's a perfect example to start with with an expanded octet. It's phosphorus pentachloride. And if we just draw the Lewis structure for it, 
the phosphorus pentachloride the, has the phosphorus has five electrons in group five. The chlorine's got seven, and there's five of them. That's thirty-five electrons. This thing has forty electrons in its picture. All right. Well, if I put the phosphorus in the middle and the chlorine's all around it, you see where this is headed. Because as soon as I put the spokes in, I've disobeyed the rule of eight. But and because phosphorus now has five pair of electrons around it, that's ten electrons. But phosphorus does meet the criteria. It's in group, it's in the third period. So consequently, its outermost shell can accommodate more than eight electrons. And it is the central atom. All right, well, we still have 40 electrons to play all together. If I, sure enough, box in all the chlorines and give them three more lone pair like I usually do, I will have used up exactly 40 electrons. Now, as we discuss shape, I'll refer to PCL5 as being a five-legged molecule. You can see why. It's got five bonded atoms sticking out from it. If it was four bonded atoms and a lone pair, it'd still be five legs. Remember, I, lone pairs count as legs. But this one has just five legs on it. Okay, well, let's do another example. Okay, well, here's one that's kind of obvious, SF6. Same thing. Sulfur's in group six. Phosphorus is in group seven times six. That's 42, let's see do my math here, 48 electrons in this picture. Okay, sulfur in the middle, fluorine's all around it. Well, you can see right away it's going to have six legs. And that's 12 electrons around the sulfur. Well, again, sulfur's in, in the third period, so it can accommodate it. And it's the central atom, so that meets the, the two benchmarks that we need for this. Now, if I box in the fluorines, kind of figure where this is going. That uses up exactly 48 electrons. Not surprising. So sure enough, there's exactly enough electrons that these guys brought to the dance to form the molecule that we know that they do. All right, and again, made us a six-legged molecule. Now I want to do one more that's a little bit more complex. So let me get rid of this one. Okay, here's one that was in your pre-lab, was ICL3. Now, there's nothing really odd about this one other than the fact that we have an abundance of electrons in this picture. Iodine's got seven. Each chlorine's got seven. There's three of them. That's 21. This thing's got 28 electrons in the picture. All right, well, like we normally do, let's put the iodine in the middle, put the chlorines around it. I'll put in the spokes. I'm filthy rich in electrons. I got 28 to play, so I'm going to go ahead and pay everybody off on the outside. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. If you look at that, a close examination shows that I've used 24 electrons in the picture. There's uh, 12 bars that I've played there. And the chlorines have all been paid. They've got their three lone pair and their one shared pair. But I need to play all 28 electrons, so I've got two pair left to play. But again, the chlorines are full. Well, this is like that example I did with the phosphorus in the middle. Any extra electrons at this point are going to go on the central atom. But in this case, I've got two pair left to play. So I'm going to give the iodine two lone pair. I'm going to stick them out on either side just for symmetry's sake. Now, notice something. That means that the iodine has ten electrons around it. It's got five legs. Two of the legs are lone pairs, but that still disobeys the rule of eight. But iodine's way down in the fifth period it can easily accommodate more than eight electrons. And in this case, it's only accommodating 10. So it has an expanded octet. And later when we talk about shape, that's a five-legged molecule, even though two of the legs are a lone pair. All right, so hopefully this little demonstration of how to draw Lewis structures and my simple set of rules on how to do it and how to do the expanded octets and when you can and when you can't, hopefully that'll help us walk through this lab. Now we've got some models to build, so what I'm going to do is get my model kit out. We'll build each one as we go through the report sheet. I'm going to have you draw the Lewis structures. We're going to talk a little bit about shapes and everything. And when you get done with your report sheet then, I'd just like you to again take a picture of it along with your pre-lab and submit it. But before we do, we need to talk a little bit about the shapes of molecules. Okay, well I've already mentioned the idea of describing molecules with reference to how many legs they have, meaning how many peripheral atoms are bonded to the central atom and how many lone pairs are sticking out there because they also count as legs. Well, this actually falls kind of under the heading of something called the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. 
all it says is that each of those legs represent a high traffic area of electrons. So consequently, that area is very negatively charged. And those legs then are going to try to arrange themselves to minimize repulsion effects, meaning they're going to try to get as far away from each other as possible. So it makes sense, for instance, that a two-legged molecule, the legs would stick out 180 degrees from one another in order to get as far away from each other as they could. Three legs would arrange themselves in a triangle and so forth. All right, so it's very logical when you look at how many legs a molecule has as to what arrangement those electron high traffic areas are going to take. All right, well, let me erase this and I'll put a quick a little table up for us. I want to point out here at the beginning that there's a subtle but significant difference between what's called the molecular shape and what's called the electron pair arrangement. The electron pair arrangement includes the lone pairs as legs, which we've discussed already. So it turns out if we define then the number of legs a molecule has as the number of peripheral atoms, that would be all the bonds that are going out to the outside atoms, and a leg, wouldn't matter if it's a single bond or a double bond, that still just counts as one leg. All right, it's just one avenue of shared electrons, whether it's a single pair or a double pair. All right, so the number of peripheral atoms plus any lone pairs that are on the central atoms, because those would count as legs. Well, it turns out that we only see molecules that either have two legs up through six legs. Nothing goes beyond the six-legged molecules, because that's 12 electrons. And if you recall, I set kind of a maximum at, at, at 12 electrons for that central atom. So here's my list. I could either have two, three, four, five, or six legs. Well, let's describe then the electron pair arrangement. How would those legs arrange themselves in such a way as to minimize repulsion? Well, if it was two legs, for instance, like something like CO2, here's the model of CO2, and notice that the model kit mimics the shape of the molecule because it puts these double bonds, these flexible bonds in. If you recall back earlier, we did a Lewis structure of CO2. It had a double bond on both sides. And sure enough, the two legs will arrange themselves as far apart as, from each other as possible, 180 degrees apart, as a matter of fact. And so it would arrange themselves linearly. So we could say pretty much any time you have a two-legged molecule that the electron pair arrangement then is linear. And that that bond angle, what they define as the angle between the two outer atoms, the two legs, would be 180 degrees. Okay, so simple enough. It's rare that you run across some two-legged molecules, but we'll see one later today in our lab. And so whenever you got those, you know that the molecule is going to be a straight line and it'll be a 180 degree bond angle. Now, if you have three legs, and we did an example of this Lewis structure earlier was SO3, sulfur trioxide. If you recall, there was a double bond on one oxygen and a single bond on the other two. But again, it doesn't matter if that's a double bond, it still counts just as one leg. Well, a three-legged molecule, in order to arrange themselves as far away from each other as possible, would take the shape of a triangle, a flat triangle. So they refer to this as a trigonal planar arrangement. trigonal planar. And the angle between the atoms is 120 degrees in a triangle. Okay, so what happens if we have a four-legged molecule? For instance, there was a molecule we did earlier was carbon tetrachloride, CCL4. It was the very first one I did. And it had a carbon in the middle with four legs, each one with a chlorine on it. Well, you'd think that four, at, four bonds trying to arrange themselves as far away from each other as possible would, would arrange themselves in a square, but it turns out that's only 90 degrees apart. You can actually take the corners of a square and bend two corners down and two corners up and form what's called a tetrahedron. Notice that the angle between the atoms is more than 90. It's actually 109 and a half degrees there. Now, a tetrahedron is perfectly symmetric. Notice that it doesn't matter which one is standing up. Everybody's 109 and a half degrees apart, so they're equally spaced and as far away from each other as they could possibly get. So sure enough, all four-legged molecules, whether or not they're occupied by atoms or they might be lone pairs, that electron pair arrangement is going to be tetrahedral. All right, so four legs, tetrahedron. Bond angle, 109.5 degrees. 
Well, now that takes us up to the ceiling of the rule of eight, four legs, because that would be eight electrons around the central atom. Now, if we go into the expanded octets to get to five legs or six legs, it turns out that whenever you've got five legs around a center and they're trying to arrange themselves comfortably, this is the shape that they take. Now, notice this shape has like an equator made out of a, a triangle, but it has an axis also with a north pole and a south pole. Notice that if you turn it sideways, it looks different because the, again, there's two different bond angles. Around the equator, the bond angles are 120 degrees, but between the axis and the equator, it's 90 degrees. So there's two different bond angles here. Again, this is called a trigonal bipyramid. Again, because it's a trigonal pyramid on the top and a trigonal pyramid on the bottom. All right, so regardless of whether these are occupied by atoms or whether they're lone pairs sticking out in space, again, recall we're going to use vacant bonding pegs to stand for the lone pairs. If there's five of them ranged around a center, this is the shape it's going to take, a trigonal bipyramid. Okay, so five, trigonal bipyramid. I'm just going to put trig bipyramid. And again, the bond angle is 90 and 120. All right, well, I think we can still see that one down at the bottom here. Six legs. Now, if you get six legs around a center, it turns out that they equally space themselves out. They look like a trigonal bipyramid, only it's a square bipyramid. Actually, it's called an octahedron because it has eight sides. But in essence, it's got a square equator and then an axis. So in this case, it doesn't matter if you turn it sideways, it still looks exactly the same because everybody's 90 degrees. So keep that in mind because this is kind of an oddball, this trigonal bipyramid with two different bond angles. It gets kind of special treatment later when we talk about molecular shape. But this one, again, with six legs, this is the arrangement. Whether they're occupied by atoms or whether they're a lone pair, just sticking out in space like that, Six legs arranged around a center has an electron pair arrangement that's referred to as an octahedron. All right, so let me put that down here. Octahedron. And again, these would all be 90 degrees. Now, does that show up on the screen? Sure does. All right, so these are the five fundamental electron pair arrangements that molecules have. And we're not going to see anything go beyond six legs. So this is pretty much the, the entire spectrum of electron pair arrangements that we're going to look at. All right, now with that in mind, this is where the lab then begins to discuss, well, what about molecular shape? Meaning, what if some of the atoms that are on here are, are, are lone pairs? And if we wanted to describe this molecule, for instance, but assume that that lone pair is not part of the molecular shape. Even though it takes up one of the six legs on this octahedron, that lone pair is just a, a pair of electrons out there whizzing around. Could we describe just the spatial arrangement of the remaining atoms that are there, assuming that the lone pair was sort of invisible? Well, you can see that this is sort of a square pyramid then. So based on an octahedron with one leg being invisible, the shape of the molecule describing just the atoms would be a square pyramid. What if there happened to be two lone pair on here? Well, with two lone pair on it, the lone pair try to get as far from each other as possible. We'd end up with what's called a square planar arrangement. So depending on how many of the positions are actually occupied by atoms, we could come up with several different molecular shapes, all based on an octahedral electron pair arrangement. For instance, what if there was a third lone pair here? Well, we'd end up with, if we wanted to describe just the spatial arrangement of the atoms, that'd be a T-shaped molecule. And if there was one last lone pair put on here, we'd end up with a molecule that's linear, still based on an octahedron with six legs, but with four of the legs being lone pair, we'd end up with just a nice linear molecule. All right, so you can understand the more legs there are, the more possibilities there are. So let me see if I can summarize that. Actually, we put a page that summarizes all the possible molecular shapes that's in your lab packet. And when we get to the report sheet, I'll pull that out and we'll take a look at it. But in the meantime, let me do a shorter rendition of it here on the board. Okay, well, here's the concept 
of molecular shape over electron pair arrangement. Again, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the lone pairs as if they're invisible and trying to describe just the spatial arrangement of the atoms involved. Now, if you start with just a linear arrangement like this with just two legs, then there's really nothing much that can happen here. If one of the legs is a lone pair, you still have a linear molecule. Nothing's going to change the shape of that. So linear is pretty boring. However, when we get to a three-legged molecule, for instance, like the SO3, well, we said the electron pair arrangement is trigonal planar. It's a flat triangle. But if each of the positions is occupied by an atom, then the molecular shape, which I've written down here below, is also trigonal planar. However, what if one of the legs were a lone pair, say like this molecule, where it's still three legs, the lone pair still counts as a leg, so it would arrange itself in a triangle. But if the lone pair were invisible, how would you describe just the remaining atoms that are there? Well, again, I've drawn that, I've sketched it here with a lone pair, and again, if it were invisible, the book refers to that as bent, or I think they might even use the term angular because that's got more syllables and it sounds more scientific. Okay, so there's two possibilities then. Now, I guess there's a third possibility. If there were two lone pair on here, you'd be back down to a linear molecule. But I, don't, I can't even recall any of those. So anyway, the idea is that if you've got three legs and all three are occupied, then it's still trigonal planar in its molecular shape, same as the electron pair arrangement. But with two legs and one lone pair, then it's referred to as bent. Well, let me put the other shapes up here and I'll show you the other possibilities. All right, well, with four legs, four legs, it gets a little bit more interesting, got more possibilities. Now, four legs is based on an electron pair arrangement that's tetrahedral, regardless of whether they're lone pairs or atoms that are out there, as long as there's four. Now, if all four positions are occupied, then the molecular shape is still described as a tetrahedron, since none of the legs are invisible. So I've drawn that here. Based on a tetrahedral electron pair arrangement, if there are no lone pairs, the molecule is still described then as tetrahedral. But if one of them is a lone pair, and I drew it this way, notice when I drew the tetrahedron, I put down my tinker toys there, I drew it with one kind of larger out here in front, like a little tripod. The book does this, they use little wedges to show a bond that's kind of coming out of the board at you. So I know my 3D drawing isn't the best, but I'm, uh, I'll try to do better. <laughs> But the ones in the background, I draw a little smaller just to give it perspective. So this looks like a little bit of a tripod with one sticking out of the top. If one of them were a lone pair, and I'll go ahead and just pull one off, now suddenly we've got this molecule where there's one down in front, two in the back, and a lone pair sticking out of the top. Well, describing that, this is a trigonal pyramid. It's not a flat triangle because that carbon's a little bit above the plane of the three chlorines there. So it would be a flat trigonal pyramid. I mean, a short one. But let's just say that it's a trigonal pyramid in its molecular shape. Now, two lone pair. We can see what happens with a tetrahedron. If you've got two lone pair, and I do it like this. Here, I can hold it up next to the, the picture with one in front, like that, one in the back, one sticking up, and one in this back corner, you end up with an angular molecule. It's hard to see in my drawing, but that's what it looks like. Okay, so another angular molecule. And again, if you had three lone pair, you'd just be down to something linear. Does everybody see that? Okay, so a little bit more possibilities here with four legs. It gets even better with five legs. Let me make a little room and I'll draw those. Okay, five legs. This gets more interesting. Now, anytime you've got five legs around the central atom, whether they're lone pairs or bonded atoms, it's going to take the shape of a trigonal bipyramid. And if all five positions are occupied, then the molecular shape is still described as trigonal bipyramid because there's no invisible legs. All right, so I drew that one here. And when I draw my trigonal bipyramids, here's how I do it. I draw kind of a flat triangle, or at least I think it looks like that with a, an atom at each corner of the triangle, and then I draw an axis through it. Now, don't get me wrong, drawing the triangle, those aren't bonds between the outer atoms. That's just to give the essence of the shape. Remember, the bonds radiate out from the central atom. I'm just trying to make it sort of look like a triangular-shaped equator 
with an axis through it. So whatever you can do to make your sketches when you do this lab at least somewhat look like mine, I'd appreciate it. All right, so if all five positions are occupied, then this is still called a trigonal bipyramid, TBP. However, if one of them is a lone pair, and here's where trigonal bipyramids are different than any other electron pair arrangement. The lone pairs must always go on the triangle. It turns out that apparently they like this 120 degrees apart. The lone pairs take up a little bit more room than a bonding pair because they're not busy surrounding another nucleus and get sucked in a little bit. So they swell out and they like this triangle. So anytime there's a lone pair, it always goes on the equator, never on the axial positions. This affects the ultimate molecular shape of the molecule and so it's an important aspect of the trigonal bipyramid. All right, well, in that case, if I put one lone pair on the triangle, how would you describe that shape? As a matter of fact, here it is. Let me put it up next to the screen. There we go. There's a trigonal bipyramid with one of its legs invisible that's on the triangle. Well, they couldn't come up with a really good one, so they refer to it as a seesaw because it looks like a little teeter-totter. All right, so when there's one lone pair on here, seesaw is the, is the description of its molecular shape. If there are two lone pairs, this is easy. This is a T-shaped molecule. Here, I can go ahead and pull one off. So you can see if you have two lone pair and you put them both on the triangle like you're supposed to, it ends up being T-shaped. Now, this is why you have to be careful because if you pulled them off the end, you'd end up with some like Y-shaped looking molecule and that's not the true molecular shape. This affects the symmetry of the molecule and affects the way it behaves. So we're trying to be critical about where those lone pairs go. For and again, on the trigonal bipyramid. If there was a third lone pair, and I sketched it down here at the bottom. Oh, by the way, this is called T-shape. Down here with three lone pair, you can see what happens. You end up with just a nice linear molecule. All the lone pairs are invisible. Okay, so there's all the five-legged possibilities, depending on what your Lewis structure shows you. Again, this all depends on you drawing the correct Lewis structure. That kind of dictates how many legs you believe the molecule to have. And that'll dictate how many lone are lone pairs and how many are, are peripheral atoms. This will lead you then to the shape of the molecule. All right, we got one more to do, the six-legged ones. Okay, six-legged molecules based on an octahedron. And again, if there are six bonded atoms, it doesn't, or six uh, legs on the molecule, whether they're bonded atoms or whether they're lone pairs, six of them means it's going to take the shape of an octahedron. I'm reassembling my molecule here. Now, if all six positions are occupied, and this is how I sketch my octahedrons, I draw kind of a flat square with an axis through it and an atom at each corner and an atom on each of the axes. If they're all occupied and none of them are invisible, then they still refer to this molecular shape as being octahedral. Same as what we call its electron pair arrangement. All right, but if one of them is a lone pair, and I'm going to put it down here on the bottom just because it makes it easier to see that this comes out to be a square pyramid. You can see that if this, this was invisible down here below, that's what we'd have. The shape would be a square pyramid. So let me do it with the model. So it looks like that. All right, well, a second lone pair now, and again, Logic dictates that the lone pair would try to get as far away from its other lone pair, unlike the trigonal bipyramid where they all go on the triangle. This time they would go opposite one another. And you end up with what's called a square planar arrangement, meaning a flat square. Now we could go on, but I don't think you're going to see molecules that do this. But if there was another lone pair, we'd be down to a T-shaped molecule. Another lone pair, we'd be down to linear. But I can't even recall examples that actually do that on six-legged molecules. I think these are the, the fundamental shapes that you're going to run into whenever you have six legs. All right, so what we need to do now is go to the report sheet. There were 10 Lewis structures that we wanted you to draw and 10 Tinker Toy models that we wanted you to build. There are several questions they clearly are going to ask you about each one. They want to know how many legs do they have, what's their electron pair arrangement, what's their molecular shape and bond angle, and, and they want a little sketch of each one. 
So let me go to the report sheet and I can kind of help you through this. Okay, well here's the report sheet for our lab for today. Now you'll notice we left you space here to draw the Lewis structures for each of these five on the front of the page and five on the back. Remember that you'll have to use the periodic table that I attached to this for you to use to look at the group numbers and determine, well, how many electrons am I allowed in my picture? So again, just refer back to the video and, and figure out how to draw the Lewis structures for each of these. Now, I'm going to build the models for you. Normally, in lab, I would have you build the Tinker Toy models, and I would come around and check them to make sure they were correct. The, the models that I'm going to build for you are revealing as to what the Lewis structure would be. Now, notice the very next column asks you for the number of electron density regions. This is a fancy way of asking you how many legs does the molecule have. Again, include all the lone pairs. So if it has lone pairs on the central atom, that counts as a leg. But then they want to know, well, how many of those total number of legs were actually lone pairs? All right, so based on this, then, we should be able to come up with a sketch and a name. Now notice I want a sketch here. So if it's linear, draw me out a little linear molecule. You don't have to use the letters for the elements, just little ball and stick sketches so that I can get the essence of what you believe the electron pair arrangement to be and give me the name of it. Remember, the electron pair arrangement can only be one of five possibilities. They go along with the number of legs. If it's two legs, it's linear, three legs, trigonal planar, four is tetrahedral, five trigonal bipyramid, six is octahedral. But then it goes on to say, well, what's the molecular shape? Now, again, we just discussed this. You have to look at the molecule and decide, well, how many of uh, the legs are actually visible and how many are lone pairs? Now, in this sketch, leave off the lone pairs. As a matter of fact, let me look here. There's an example that was in the lab text right here. Let me do this one. This is ammonia. Here's its Lewis structure with one lone pair and three other legs. So it has a total of four legs, one of which is a lone pair. I sketched it as a tetrahedron. Notice I included the lone pair here with that sketch and mentioned it's a tetrahedral shape. But then with the molecular shape, I left the lone pair off to show that there's just remaining a trigonal pyramid here. I gave the bond angle, which is based on the electron pair arrangement of 109 and a half degrees between each of the legs. All right, so this is what we want you to complete for each of 10 molecules. Now again, I'm going to do the Tinker Toy models for you and give you some little tips as we go along. But what you can refer to, by the way, I mentioned this earlier, this sheet where we kind of condensed all the possible molecular shapes that you could get from each of the fundamental electron pair arrangements. Notice here for trigonal planar that if all of the positions are occupied, then it would be trigonal planar if it had three legs. But if it was two bonded atoms and one lone pair for a total of three legs, that's a bent molecule where one of the points of the triangle is invisible. Well, you can see then how this grid works, that the tetrahedral possibilities are either being tetrahedral if everybody's occupied, or being a trigonal pyramid if one of them's a lone pair, or being a bent molecule if two of them are. Remember, the possibilities increase the more legs we have. So down here with five legs, you could have things that referred to a seesaw when there was one lone pair. Remember, the lone pairs always go on the triangle with this particular one, the trigonal bipyramid. Then with the octahedral, we mentioned that these are the only shapes you usually see with that electron pair arrangement. You'll see either an octahedral molecular shape where all the positions are occupied, or a square pyramid where there's one lone pair, or a square planar where there's two lone pair. So again, this table can be helpful then in discerning what the molecular shape is based on the electron pair arrangement that you come up with. All right, well, let's get right to it. Once you've drawn the Lewis structures for these, I'll show you the Tinker Toy models. The first one, H2S, looks like this. Now, again, when you draw the Lewis structure for it, you'll see that, sure enough, it ends up coming up four-legged. All right, so I'm going to do each of these models and turn them around so you can see them like this. But I'm going to let you draw your own conclusions then as to molecular shape, bond angles, that sort of thing. All right, the next one is CO2, which we showed earlier. 
today was uh, this one, double bonds on both sides. I drew this Lewis structure earlier in the video. But again, based on this electron pair arrangement, you can pretty much figure out the rest of this. Try to make your sketches at least look somewhat, you know, like the shape that you intend them to be. Now, the next one, pH 3, it ends up looking like this. The phosphorus ends up with one lone pair, the three hydrogens that are there. So again, draw me a, a, an accurate Lewis structure of that, and then tell me how many total legs it has, how many are lone pairs, uh, give me the electron pair arrangement, molecular shape, and bond angle. The quiz, by the way, is going to look something like this that I'm going to send you next week. All right, now the next one, HCN. Interesting. Let me scooch this up so you can see this one. HCN down here ends up with a triple bond in it. Well, when you total up the electrons, you'll see that this is really about the only way that you could end up using uh, the electrons, the total that you get for this molecule, and ending up satisfying the rule of eight and the rule of two for hydrogen. Now remember, a triple bond, double bond, single bond, doesn't matter. That's still just one leg emanating to the nitrogen from the carbon. So this turns out to be two-legged. The last one, CF4, looks like this. All right, again, now I'm not showing lone pairs out on the peripheral atoms. I'm more interested about the central atom. But it has no lone pairs, just has four single bonds out to the four fluorines. So again, based on that and your Lewis structure, should be able to answer the remaining questions that are there. All right, well, let me flip the page over and make a few more models, and we'll wrap this up. Okay, well, here we go on the back page. And the first one, number six here, is SO3. And we did this one earlier with the double bond on one of the oxygen, single bonds to the others. Don't forget to show me the lone pairs on the peripheral atoms, even though I don't show them here in my Tinker Toy model. But you can see that this is clearly a three-legged molecule, all three legs occupied. Xenon difluoride turns out to be a five-legged molecule. And it looks like this. Remember, lone pairs always go on the triangle. So see if this model matches your Lewis structure with three lone pair and two peripheral atoms. That's the xenon difluoride. Uh, the third one here, SFO, let me see if I can find it, SF4. Again, a five-legged molecule with one lone pair and four bonded atoms. This is a shape that it takes. Remember, again, lone pair goes on the triangle. And you can refer to that grid to figure out what the shape was, but if you recall, this one had kind of an odd name to it. So this is the one that's SF4. Now, the next one, SBCL5, also five-legged, but in this case, all five legs are occupied. And again, five-legged molecules always take an electron pair arrangement that's trigonal bipyramidal. That's a trigonal bipyramid. And the very last one, the ICL5, turns out to be a six-legged electron pair arrangement. However, one of the legs is a lone pair. So again, that gives it a molecular shape that's slightly different than its electron pair arrangement. And again, you can use the grid to describe that. Now, those models should allow you then to tell me the total number of legs, how many are lone pairs, uh, give me a sketch of the electron pair arrangement and its name, molecular shape, and bond angles. Okay, well, that pretty much completes the lab. Now, uh, this should help you also answer the questions that were in the pre-lab. Please make sure that you complete that along with this report sheet take a picture of it, and again, front and back. Make sure your name's on every page, please, and, uh, and submit that. Now, in addition, I sent you a quiz over Beer's Law, so make sure that you also submit that uh, with this lab. Well, that's that then, our first good look at Lewis structures. Now, we've got another Lewis structure-like lab slated for you for next week on hybridization. We're going to look a little closer to how the electrons are distributed in Lewis structures, talk a little bit about molecule polarity, that sort of thing. And now there's going to be a quiz attached with next week's lab over this one, and it'll involve drawing Lewis structures. It'll pretty much look like the report sheet uh, for today's lab. So today, when you're finished with this, Make sure that you submit your, let's see, there's a quiz over the Beer's Law lab that you need to submit, along with the pre-lab and the report sheet for this lab. Okay, well, hope this wasn't too painful, and I'll see you next week in our hybridization lab. So long.